So, yeah, perfect, it's recording. So this is titled Ophthalmology for Finals. I'm gonna emphasize that it's for finals um, because I'm not here to explain the background of everything. Um, it's more of a key high yield facts that you need to pick up on for exams and as a GP recognize in practice. Um, so that's what that's about. A few disclaimers. I haven't actually done my ophthalmology placement. It was in mid-March when we all were told to go home. Um, however, we, my friends and I used these sort of high yield facts before our finals, which were in August online and found them really, really useful. And I used this and got 100% in my ophthalmology section in my finals. So hopefully this can be of some use. Um, so yeah, my name is Sophie Sevens. I'm currently intercalating in London at Imperial and there's my email if you have any questions after, or any questions in general. Um, so this talk will be about 45 minutes going through brief investigations and red flags and then rapid onset um, presentations and then slow onset. And then we'll go through some past med questions, which I use so much for my revision finals. And then we can have 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions. As Catherine said, pop any questions if you think about them during whilst I'm speaking um, in the chat and then we'll go through them at the end. Um, and yeah, feedback would be greatly appreciated at the end. And I'm gonna go quite quickly through the slides, but there will be a recording, um, I believe put up on the YouTube channel um, if you want to go through the slides and read through all of the bits properly. Um, great, okay. Um, I'll just get started then. So, first of all, I'm going to go through investigations. So, you've got the classic Snellen chart. 6 6 is normal, often confused with 2020, which is the American, but 6 6 is used here. Um, 6 10 is poor, 6 5 is better than normal. It basically compares what you can read compared to um, someone with normal vision where they'd read it from. So you can read from six meters, but someone with normal vision can read that from 10 meters away. So that's why it's poor. Um, okay, and then just the normal eye examination, looking at visual fields um, and fundoscopy. And then more relevant to this talk would be fluorescein staining, which I'll go through in a bit more detail, but this can be um, used to look at keratitis, corneal abrasions and corneal ulcers. Another thing I'll talk about in more detail is glaucoma. Um, and the investigation is Goldman Applination Tonometry, which measures intraocular pressure. You can also have a CT scan, corneal topography, and fluorescein angiography. Angiography looking at um, the vessels in ARMD and neovascularization. Just an example of fluorescein staining here. So this would be a corneal abrasion. This is a corneal ulcer and this is keratitis, but we'll go to that in more detail, but it just gives you an idea about what you're looking for. Okay, so red flag criteria, urgent referral criteria, I cannot stress this enough. This is really, really important to learn before your finals. Um, we had a CBL on it. I don't know whether you guys do as well, but I would really recommend going through that CBL and learning it inside out. Um, it's so easy to ask a question and the management select, you select changes if it, there are any symptoms that are red flags. So really important. Um, so I'm gonna go through the ones they mentioned in the CBL. First of all, a loss of red reflex in a child. If anybody wants to shout out, if they know, I'll put it in the chat, feel free. Um, if it's a Thursday evening, no interaction night, then I'll just go through, I'll just go through them. You can, uh, you'll have a look at the video anyway, at the end. Um, okay, so a loss of red reflex in a child is classically, well, red flag for retinoblastoma. Um, a red painful eye with a dilated pupil would be red flag for closed angle glaucoma. And a headache visual disturbance is classically temporal arteritis. Um, and these are just the key things to look out for when you're reading that pa patient case um, that gives you an idea that it might be something more serious going on. Um, and if any of these um, are symptoms, then you would do a same day ophthalmology referral. And that would be one of the options you take in the exam. Okay, so I've broken it down to rapid onset and slow onset. And this is how the CBL broke it down, which I thought was quite useful. 
um, it just helps them keep all these differentials because they can get quite muddled. Um, so first of all, oh yeah, so I go into glaucoma and these ones in a lot of depth and then the other ones in like a little bit of depth. Um, so just consider that when you're backing this up with your own revision. And I also found it useful breaking into painful and painless causes of rapid onset vision loss um, or just in general, like a painful presentation. If you see it in a GP, you know where to differentiate. Um, something we're gonna highlight is that you can often get confused between scleritis and episcleritis. So scleritis painful, episcleritis is typically painless. Um, so good, good to have in your head when you're thinking of differentials. Okay, so we're gonna do some spot diagnoses. Um, so this one, um, if you take a look, at the picture and then I've got a clue of halos. Have a think about what this might be. If anyone wants to shout out, feel free, otherwise I'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so this is referring to closed angle glaucoma. So this is a blockage in the aqueous humor reabsorption through the trabecular meshwork. Um, and this is the closed angle compared to an open angle glaucoma. Um, this classic symptoms you wanna look out for is a hazy cornea, a semi-dilated and fixed pupil, and they can see halos around the light. So if you go back, oh, sorry, halos, and this is a hazy cornea and it is fixed, um, semi-dilated. Um, risk factor importantly is family history, but you can have other ones. And this is red flag referral criteria. So it's the same day assessment by an ophthalmologist if you see it in GP. Um, if there's a delay waiting for an ambulance, then this is an explanation of what you can do. But for finals, focus on the medication, which can be administered to reduce intraocular pressure. So this is notably pilocarpine, acetazolamide, glycerol mannitol, and dozolamide and bromonidine. Um, I would focus on the first two. Um, it's quite interesting how they try and reduce intraocular pressure. However, the definitive management would be a laser iridotomy, which um, makes a hole in the iris to allow, like, re release that pressure. Um, also important to learn these medications because they do crop up in a lot of ophthalmology um, sort of conditions. Um, so good to know. Okay, so next spot diagnoses. Have a think about what this could be. So this is retinal tear and detachment. Something um, that came up in the CBL whilst we were in Blackpool was the process of retinal detachment, which is quite important to understand how you get the floaters and flashing lights. So first of all, the posterior vitreous detaches, and this causes the new sudden floaters, a key symptom. And then you get the traction, which stimulates flashing lights in your vision. And then this traction eventually causes it to tear. And then once the retina is teared, you then get retinal detachment. And that's when you get your loss of sight. Um, a key risk factor they also highlighted in CBL was myopia. Um, and yeah, as I've mentioned, you can get floaters and flashing lights. And this is again, a same day referral to ophthalmology. Um, it's quite interesting pictures. Um, don't be, um, don't have like tunnel vision, if you excuse the pun, with floaters. They aren't always causes of retinal detachment. They can also be causes of these differentials. So bear that in mind. Okay, and the next one, have a think about what this could be um, from fundoscopy, and that's a little clue. So this is referring to age-related macular degeneration. This is a key um, presentation that Liverpool like to bring up. Um, here are the layers of the macula. If you get a consultant on placement, they might ask you that. So I would bear that in mind. Um, the way I break it up, so you can either have wet or dry ARMD. I think of wet as because it involves knee vascularization, it like involves fluids, and those are the sort of things you um, see on the fundoscopy. So wet fluid edema, and that's all linked. Whereas dry, the way I remember it is dry drusen deposits. Um, so that's why I split it up in my head. Um, a lot of that I'll be talking about the weird ways I split it up in my head. Help me remember it because there's so much to remember. Um, if it works for you, it works for you. 
Um, so risk factors are quite generic. Um, the key symptom here is a central visual field loss, also termed a scotoma, as seen here. And the classic investigation they like to bring up in questions is wavy lines on an AMSA grid. So that's really important. Also, fluorescein and geography can look at the neovascularization process seen in wet type. Now, the management is different for both. Dry is a degenerative process, so dry occurs first. And the management of dry is essentially control risk factors, um, smoking being one of the key ones here. So that's all really that you can do to try and prevent it deteriorating into wet ARMD. And because you have this neovascularization, which is a key characteristic of wet type, you want to use anti-veg medications. So these are listed here, and these are injected into the vitreous chamber once a month. So if you see a patient who has intravitreous injections once a month, like this could suggest that they have wet area on D. Um, VEG is vascular endothelial growth factor, I believe. So you can kind of work out that if this is stimulating the growth of the vascular endothelium, you want anti that medication. Um, and wet ARMD is quite severe. It can lead to bilateral disease and vision loss. So you do really want to focus on treating those risk factors and controlling those in GP. Um, I find this quite useful to break it down. I, I, I sometimes got a bit confused when I was revising for finals, sort of the underlying diagnoses of different ophthalmology presentations um, that the patient may have. Um, I'm gonna focus on PEAR, so this is the mnemonic I use for HLA B27 associated diseases. These are sort of a theme in rheumatology, um, but just be aware that there could be an underlying diagnosis here. Um, and when you're revising, it's helpful to split them up. Um, and also what they look like, because they are slightly different. Okay, that was also CBL. I've included CBL if it's included in ours, so it's a good as reference point. Okay, so that was the rapid onset presentation, and now I'm going to go through slow onset. These, they love to bring them up. These are your bread and butter ophthalmology presentations, um, especially managing a chronic condition in GP. So it's really important to bear in mind and know the management inside out. So this one is, hopefully you can all guess, um, you might be wondering why I put Starburst there. Um, so this is referring to cataracts. One of their presentations, they can see starbursts around lights. Um, that's what the halos look like around lights in glaucoma. And this is the typical starburst sort of um, symptom. So classically, cataracts presents um, with a slow blurring of vision and importantly, a change in color vision. They can go like browny yellowy um, and it's also worse at night. Classical risk factors, um, including steroids um, as well, important to bear in mind. And then a key investigation findings are cloudy lens with the loss of red reflex due to the cloudy lens. Um, and then management, you want to base it on the patient. You don't want to send them with cataract surgery if it's not affecting their day-to-day -day life. So you need to talk to the patient and really understand how it is day to day um, and see what management might be best for them. Um, so you can give glasses um, and then the surgical management of cataract surgery is called a phaco emulsification. This is a day case followed by a two week course of antibiotics and steroid eye drops. Um, complications, so it's rare, but it's really bad if you do get it. This is a complication of the phaco emulsification surgery. It's called endophthalmitis. It's an infection which you have to treat with intravitreal antibiotics and you can risk losing the eye um, or vision. So if you Google endophthalmitis, the images are, it doesn't look good basically, um, but it is important to understand that you, you do have complications from cataract surgery sometimes and it's important to discuss this with the patient, see what they prefer. Um, okay, so this one, these images, might be quite rogue, um, but you'll understand why I put them here. Um, so basically this is referring to open angle glaucoma. So as compared to a um, age related macular degeneration where you get the central vision loss and the scotoma, 
in glaucoma, which is open angle, you get a tunnel vision loss. So you get loss of peripheral vision. Um, so it's an important way to differentiate them. And as I mentioned, you get you use the Goldman applanation tonometry, which measures the intraocular pressure. You can also look at the optic disc to cup ratio, which is quite a good way of understanding the pressure inside the eye. And visual fields, if you assess them, they may be lost, basically. Um, management, you ideally want to start treating when it gets above 24 pr um, pressure in there. And then this is what I was referring to in the pictures. So the mainstay of management is prostaglandin analog eye drops, also called latanoprost. Um, the side effects of these are eyelash growth and eyelid pigmentation. So if we go back, we can see here this guy, he, it suggested that he has glaucoma in this side and he's using his eye drops in this side because he's got longer lashes and his iris is more pigmented. Similarly in this woman, she probably has glaucoma in the side because her iris is more pigmented on the side. And also if you Google latanoprost, it comes up with loads of eyelash growth serums because it does help grow your eyelashes. So, you know, it's, it keeps interesting. Um, and then these are other uh, medications. They've come up in previous conditions as well. So it's good to understand how they act um, in ophthalmology presentations. Um, so yeah, good to know those. And then complications would be closed angle glaucoma. Okay, so which, what am I referring to here in terms of chronic conditions? Have a think. Okay, so this one is suggesting hypertensive retinopathy. So this is classified by the Keith Wagner classification and it's based on fundoscopy findings. So I would recommend learning the differences between the stages. Um, importantly, you get papilledema at stage four, um, which is the most severe stage and management is essentially controlling risk factors um, in GP and trying to prevent the severity getting worse. Um, I've also included, because I, I used to get quite confused between the different stages, this is sort of what you'd be looking for on fundoscopy if you were very good at doing fundoscopy. Um, and that's how the different stages present. Here you've got optic disc swelling and papilledema. I also like to understand the pathophysiology going on behind it and why you get those presentations because linking that to hypertension in this patient can help you understand why you see what you see on fundoscopy. So that's always good to, to know. Okay, so conversely, and something that's often confused with hypertensive retinopathy is diabetic retinopathy. This is also classified, but very differently. So the key difference here is non-proliferative or proliferative. This can also be called pre-proliferative. Pre the key difference is that with proliferative, you have near vascularization and vitreous hemorrhage, hemorrhages. So again, kind of linking it to wet ARMD, you start to get um, fluid leaking and um, involvement of blood vessels and things like that. So that's the worst stage. Um, in terms of management, laser photocoagulation is quite good, um, or you can just use medication, again, to prevent this new vascularization seen in proliferative stages. Um, I've also included an image of what you might see. So this is mild compared to proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Here you can see that vitreous hemorrhaging um, and new vascularization and things like that. Um, I also, yeah, so this is proliferative. I don't know whether you can see that. But again, vitreous hemorrhages, and you can see that that looks remarkably different to mild. So you've got those new blood vessels forming as well as the little hemorrhages. Okay, and this is diabetic maculopathy where you get macular edema. Um, and again, this is sort of why you get what you see. Um, the IRMA is a key feature of diabetic retinopathy that is not seen in hypertensive retinopathy. And this is essentially microvascular abnormality. So you can see there, it looks abnormal. Um, you also get venous feeding, which is shown nicely there. Okay. 
Um, again, because I got confused, I found it helpful to split up what you see in each condition. So when you're learning, the sort of key features that you're going to pick out from an examination or a case presentation, I wouldn't learn cotton wool spots and hard exudates because you see them in both. I would learn the key different, different findings. So silver wiring and AV nipping is more common in hypertensive retinopathy, whereas IMRA and venous beading is very specific for diabetic retinopathy. So just try and make it easy for yourself and break it up. Okay. So now it's like two slides on um, childhood ophthalmology presentations. I would say it's good to know your definitions. If it comes up in a question, you've got to know what they're talking about. Um, so have a look over those. And then we had a CBL dedicated to strabismus basically. So really important to understand um, concomitant squints, um, they are basically due to extraocular muscles um, and this not working properly. And convergent is more common than divergent. Um, and paralytic squints, I won't really worry about those too much. Um, the key thing for finals would be the Hirschberg's test, also called the corneal light reflex test. So that's a common examination um, performed to detect the strabismus and to look at the eye movements. I'm not going to try and explain it. If you look on YouTube, that's your best way of trying to understand um, what they do and how the eye movements move in response to the examiner's um, blocking light in different eyes. Um, it's really clever, but that's the key investigation you want for strabismus. Um, management, importantly, needs to start before eight years old. Basically, you want to try and prevent, you want to train the brain to fix the, um, the extraocular muscles and the way they respond. Um, you don't want the brain to just rely on the one eye. So what you want to do is if you see a kid in GP and you're suspecting um, strabismus, refer to ophthalmology. Um, first, then you want to rule out the underlying pathology because in children, it could be caused by lots of other different things. It's really important to pick those up, um, particularly a retinoblastoma could present similarly. Um, and then the mainstay of management is an occlusive patch. Um, you can also get eye drops to blur out the vision, but that's done in the good eye. So you cover up the good eye and then this forces the lazy eye or the bad eye to fix itself. And it forces the brain to form those communications and adjust the eye basically. Um, and complications if you don't treat it is amblopia. Okay. So now we have a few spot diagnoses. So if you want to pop in the chat, if you want to just think about it, that's fine. Um, it should come. And it's the CBLs basically did spot diagnoses in the questions. So it's quite a, a common theme in Liverpool. Um, but this, everyone should be thinking retinoblastoma. Um, so this is loss of the red reflex when you shine the light from fundoscopy in the child's eye. And this is brief management. It's niche. I wouldn't learn it for finals, but it's just quite interesting to know. Um, but this is a red flag referral criteria, definitely. Um, okay, so this is a classic one as well. Have a think. Okay, so this is central retinal artery occlusion. And it's classically termed a pale retina with a cherry red spot. So if you are, so if the retinal artery is occluded, this is an emergency. So immediate referral, and then you want to try and dislodge whatever is blocking the artery. So you can either do this by an ocular massage. Um, I think something more common is sublingual eyes sorbide dinitrate to dilate the artery. But the most important thing with this is that it should be an underlying cause in most cases. So you really want to try and do a risk factor management and investigations to understand why they, their retinal artery got occluded. Either cardiovascular disease or commonly temporal arteritis. So you wanna measure the ESR, do a temporal artery biopsy um, and give high dose PRED. Um, but that's rheumatology. Um, okay, so this one, 
central retinal oh, region. Thank you. thank you. Yes. Um. um this is retinal vein. Um. People have put some answers in the chat. I'm not sure if you've been able to see them. That's all. Oh, I haven't. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Well, it looks like you all got them right. So that's great. Um. Yeah. Well done, guys. Um. I'll keep an eye on that. Sorry. So yeah, this is retinal vein occlusion, um, classically termed flame and block hemorrhages of blood and thunder. It's quite a severe presentation. This is, I mean, this is a bad image. Um, it's quite severe. But if you think about it, if the retinal vein is occluded, blood and fluid isn't getting out of the eye. So you've got hemorrhages within the retina. Um, so that's really bad. Um, again, immediate referral. You get macular edema because the fluid isn't being drained out of the eye. So you can do laser photocoagulation. Um, intravitreal steroids are also quite useful, again, to treat the edema. And then again, we have these anti-veg therapies um, for the neovascularization to prevent that from happening if you've got um, this blood that's blocked in this eye. Um, cool. So again, like these, these spot diagnoses, are, I haven't gone into as much depth because I've only gone like the classic presentations you'll probably get in finals. But again, this does come up in learning objectives here and there. Okay, so anyone gonna be brave in the chat? I'll check it now, I promise. Uh, yes, well done. So, well, have I got three different types? So this is conjunctivitis, thank you. Okay, so I've I've split the different types because it's quite easy to visualize them um, when you do see them. So this is bacterial. Classically, eyes stuck together in the mornings. It's really gunky, purulent discharge um, that they'll complain of and it's highly contagious. So it, they can often touch one eye and then it goes into the other. So it can be bilateral sometimes. Um, so that's more of a gunky presentation um, in terms of the discharge. Whereas viral, is a clearer discharge and they'll most likely have an underlying underlying like um, virus going on. So look for a sore throat, look for the lymphadenopathy. Um, again, you can treat this, you can't really treat that. Um, I'll go into treatment. And then this is allergic, I find quite interesting. So you basically just have lid swelling, it's itchy. Um, and then usually in a finals question, they'll have some form of allergen contact to give you a hint that it's that, because um, it is less commonly put in questions. So this is the management. I know this sounds really specific and niche. I don't know whether it's past medicine that suggested this management plan or whether it's CBL, but it came up quite a lot. I would just learn it. Um, but the key thing here is chloramphenicol 0.5% eye drops. This is for bacterial. Um, you can advise on hygiene for all of these, to be honest. Um, talk about allergen exposure in this one, um, but the main one that will come up is bacterial conjunctivitis, and this is the treatment. Um, and this would be from GP. You wouldn't immediately refer to these people. Cool, okay, next one. This is slightly harder. Let's try and remind myself what it is. Any answer to the chat? Okay, so this is optic neuritis. Um, it's hard to do as a spot diagnosis because the classic presentation description will make it clearer. But this is classically a red desaturation with a central scotoma. Um, as I mentioned, you get a central scotoma, so central vision loss in age-related macular degeneration um, and this one. Um, that's a bit of an overview of, you know, the different visual field defects you can get, but I would focus on the central scotoma, that's probably more common in terms of finals. Okay, three risk factors of optic neuritis. This is such an easy question they can ask you, and it's good to think when a person is presenting. Yes, nice one. Multiple sclerosis, that's one of them. Um, it can really help when you're trying to figure out what the patient has if you think about their risk factors. Um, okay, so we've got the main one basically. Multiple sclerosis is a classic finals question in terms of optoneuritis. Other ones include diabetes and syphilis. So the management is high dose steroids. Um, recovery is about four to six weeks. And then 
if you're thinking multiple sclerosis, this is a quite good investigation to consider um, an MRI um, to look at your risk of developing multiple sclerosis or if you have lesions. Okay, right. Some lovely pictures. What am I suggesting here? I've kind of already mentioned it. Mm, good thinking. However, I don't go into corneal ulceration that much. You've got the other two others that I talked about in terms of fluorescein staining. There's one other I talked about, abrasions, corneal ulceration, and yes, that is right. Herpes eye infection, and um, that is a type of what I've shown here. So I'm showing keratitis. This is viral keratitis, what you're referring to. So it's caused most commonly by herpes simplex virus, and it shows on fluorescein staining this classic, like branch like stain. Um, but yeah, that's very typical for herpes viral keratitis. The next one is bacterial keratitis. I agree, this does look like a corneal ulcer. Um, probably won't have to differentiate between the two, to be honest. But um, causative agents include Pseudomonas and Staph aureus. This is exposure keratitis. Um, you only really see this probably in ectropian eyelids. So all people can get that where their lower eyelid or their top eyelid droops down and that exposure can just cause irritation um, to the eye. So that's one thing to think about. This is fungal keratitis um, caused by candida or aspergillus most commonly, and you get a white pus discharge. Um, lovely. And then contact keratitis, um, probably quite common, um, caused by can contact lens wearers and yeah, just irritation to the eye basically. Um, but it's a lot less hard to spot and it's um, not usually done by fluorescein staining. But this is the key one you want to think about viral. So well done for getting that one. Okay, so I've mentioned it, this kind of revision. Trying to look at the chat. What am I suggesting? From what I've gone through, obviously there are other forms of visual field loss, but from what I've gone through, so yeah, exactly. So this open angle can be closed angle. Um, they'll prevent, present more with fixed semi-dilated hazy cornea. That's a classic one, but they probably will have tunnel vision as well. Um, and they have, yeah, peripheral field loss. So if they, if you do your examination in GP and have peripheral field loss and they have this fixed dilated pupil, then urgent referral, please. Um, Age-related max degeneration, as I said, is a central scotoma. Fab, well done, guys. Okay, so this is a brief overview of the medication we've discussed, um, just the key ones. The anti medication come up again. Um, prostaglandin analogues um, cause eyelash growth and iris pigmentation for glaucoma. And then intraocular pressure reducing medication, important for emergency treatment of closed angle glaucoma until you can get that laser iridotomy to reduce the pressure properly. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into questions. This is where I'm actually gonna keep the chat open. Um, I've just used past med just because that's all I did for finals revision. Um, plus I didn't have clinical placement to go to because of COVID, so it was quite useful. Um, so if anybody can suggest something. Yes, well done. So this is neovascularization. Um, everything else is seen in pre-proliferative retinopathy. Pre-proliferative being the key point here because proliferative suggests neovascularization. So that's a key difference. So what's not present is neovascularization and pre-proliferative retinopathy. Cool. Um, but yeah, all of these are present in diabetic pre-proliferative retinopathy. Fab, well done. Next one. Okay, it's, quite, it's, it's quite tricky, but when you think about painful versus painless different differentials in that table I did, it breaks it down.
Okay, well done, episcleritis, yes. So all the other presentations would be painful. But this guy has no pain. Um, so yeah, this is episcleritis, well done. So she's got dry, ARMD, eyesight is deteriorating, never smokes, taking supplements. As a GP, she comes in, she asks if you can do anything else. What do you suggest? Yes, well done. Really annoyingly, there's nothing else you can really do until knee vascularization occurs, which is wet ARMD. And that's your anti-veg medication. Um, but as far as I know, when I made this PowerPoint, there's not much else you can do other than risk factor management. That's why it's so important to try and help these patients before it does deteriorate to wet ARMD. Great, well done, very well. So four-year-old female, got blurred vision, progressing, um, associated with pain, um, colors are dimming, um, she's got a relative afferent pupillary defect, and she's got an elevated optic disc with blurred margins. What underlying condition is most likely to have caused this presentation? Well done. Yeah, such a classic. So I know you shouldn't, you should really think about differentials. However, when you see a 40 year old female in a question, apparently they can't seem to think of any other people that multiple sclerosis would occur in, but 40 year old female is a classic case for multiple sclerosis. Um, so, but then you wanna look at, you know, elevated optic disc, um, blurred vision, pain, you're thinking optic neuritis caused by multiple sclerosis. Um, think about other differentials. I find it useful to have a look and see what they haven't included on purpose so that you haven't gone down the wrong route. So like idiopathic intracranial hypertension, they may talk about um, her BMI or something like that. Um, and other risk factors, maybe visual fields for this one, things like that. So yeah, multiple sclerosis is the best answer here. Great. Okay. So five-year-old boy, um, two-day history of painful swelling. Um, he's unsettled. Eyelid is erythematous and edematous and proptosis is noted as well as limited ocular movement. The globe is not affected and the other eye is fine. What imaging should you do? Like the first one. I feel like I only know this because I did pass medicine to death, but it does come up a lot. Yes, well done. So this is a contrast enhanced CT scan of the orbit, sciences and brain. So you are thinking of periorbital cellulitis, which can complicate and become worse and be orbital cellulitis. So periorbital cellulitis is round the orbit. So it's not a sphere. Whereas when it starts to involve the orbit, you've got the risk of it, the infection going to the brain. So that's really bad. So basically you want to do a CT head and look at where the infection is and try and differentiate between periorbital and orbital. And the management is slightly different. Um, but yeah, try and give antibiotics to settle him because that's useful. Um, but yeah, classic. That's the first one you would do. Okay, so 73 old female, left shoulder and arm pain, sudden worsening, pain is now unmanageable with regular cocodamol. Patient's left pupil is smaller and the other side um, than the other side and the eyelid is lagging slightly. Um, you're in GP, what question would you ask her to help with your, yes, perfect. Lovely guys, well done. Okay, so this is suggesting a presentation um, of Panko syndrome. So symptoms, this is symptoms caused by an apical malignant tumor in the lung um, and smoking history would therefore be important. Think about lung cancer. Um, essentially you get Horner syndrome because it's ipsilateral invasion of the sympathetic cervical plexus. 
then you also get shoulder and arm pain due to brachial plexus invasion mm -hmm. of this cancer. So it's called Panko syndrome because it's a collection um, of symptoms, basically. Great. Do I have another one? Go ahead, another one. Okay, 68 year old retired biomedical scientist diagnosed with open angle glaucoma, um, peripheral sight loss, which is classic, and commenced on Timolol. What is the mechanism? I know I haven't taught this to you today, but I would go through pharmacology. It's quite, it's an easy question to ask like this one. Um, but I have tried to include sort of the main detail in my presentation. If you want to look through slides. Um, so this reduces the intraocular pressure. So not quite. It is reduces aqueous secretion by the ciliary body. So it helps the ciliary body um like it stops it producing aqueous so that it doesn't get worse and worse and worse um because the flow is stopped um that's just something to learn really um but yeah an easy question they could bring up okay cool that's everything i have um if you could fill in feedback that'd be really helpful help me help you um, again, if you have any questions, um,